When you got it, flaunt it. Tell him, Dally, baby. Picasso called Dali an outboard motor that's always running. Dali thought himself a genius with the right to indulge in whatever lunacy popped into his head. Painter, sculptor, writer and filmmaker Salvador Dali, 1904 to 1989, was one of the century's greatest exhibitionists and eccentrics and was rewarded with fierce controversy wherever he went. He was one of the first to apply the insights of Sigmund Freud and psychoanalysis to the art of painting. He brought extraordinary sensitivity, imagination and concern for precision to bear upon submerged levels of consciousness. This lively biography presents the infamous surrealist in full colour and in his own words. His provocative ideas are all here, from the soft watches to the notorious burning giraffe and the fantastic phenomenon that was Salvador Dali is grasped entire and placed in his various contexts. Mm. A dandy, wrote Charles Baudelaire, must be looking in his mirror at all times, waking and sleeping. Dali could easily have become the living proof of Baudelaire's dictum, but the literal mirror was not enough for him. Dali needed mirrors of many kinds, his pictures, his admirers, newspapers and magazines and television, and even that still left him unsatisfied. So one Christmas, he took a walk in the streets of New York carrying a bell. He would ring it wherever he felt people were not paying enough attention to him. The thought of not being recognised was unbearable. True to himself to the bitter end, he delighted in following Catalonian television's bulletins on his state of health during his last days alive in Quiron Hospital in Barcelona. He wanted to hear people talking about him and he also wanted to know whether his health would revive or whether he would be dying soon. At the age of six, he wanted to be a female cook. He specified the gender. At seven, he wanted to be Napoleon. Ever since, my ambition has been continually on the increase, as has my megalomania. Now all I want to be is Salvador Dali. But the closer I get to my goal, the further Salvador Dali drifts away from me. Hmm. Maybe from fear of deprivation, maybe because of his frightful Catalonian atavism, Dali now set about frantically making surrealist artifacts out of bread. He had already had an especial liking for bread. In his museum at the Figueras, he papered the walls with round Catalonian loaves. Often he would take a loaf, hug it and lick it and nibble it, and then stand it up as if it were his latest invention. Nothing could be simpler than to cut out two neat, regular holes on the back of the loaf and insert an inkwell in each one. What could be more degrading and aesthetic than to see this bread inkstand become gradually stained in the course of use with the involuntary splatterings of pelican ink? In 
in The Secret Life, Dali gives examples of inspirations derived from his famous method. The method itself, he commented, was beyond his understanding, as were many of his ideas, the full significance of which he was only to perceive later. One day I hollowed out entirely an end of a loaf of bread, and what do you think I put inside it? I put a bronze Buddha, whose metallic surface I completely covered with dead fleas. After putting the Buddha inside the bread, I closed the opening with a little piece of wood, and I cemented the hole, including the bread, sealing it hermetically in such a way as to form a homogeneous hole, which looked like a little urn, on which I wrote, horse jam. What does that mean, eh? <laughs> the conquest of the irrational. Hey! Dali's enemies and allies tend to have one thing in common. They largely ignore his own writings. Yet when Dali availed himself of the written or spoken word, he did so with all his extravagance and bravado, with his core reticence and his embarrassed revelations, and above all with the man's unique brilliance, and often his statements contain vital information on his evolution as a painter. The tempestuous ups and downs of his life, his tenderness and cruelty, and the stern logic that governed the apparent contradictions in his thought. Eccentric though Dali was, through it all there ran an exemplary continuity. The secret life of Salvador Dali gives us the first steps the child took, the youth's quest for identity, the upheavals in his life, and the hidden passionate sides of a provocative and free-thinking mind that caused scandals from the outset, cared nothing for the opinions of others, and tended to thrive on people's stupidity. First, it dissolves. Happy bubbles. But devoted bubbles. Then the alka seltzer shoots into the stomach. Here it neutralizes that bad excess acid. Meantime, the specially buffer aspirin is speeding into your bloodstream to all places of pain. So those beautiful places will feel beautiful again. Alka seltzer is a work of art, truly one of a kind, like uh, Dali. Andre Breton had to admit that Dali's paranoic, critical method had provided surrealism with an instrument of prime importance. Even Andre Therion, who was one of the dogmatic hardliners of the group, later conceded. Dali's contribution to surrealism was of immense importance to the life of the group and the evolution of its ideology. Those who have maintained anything to the contrary have either not been telling the truth or have understood nothing at all. Nor is it true that Dali ceased to be a great painter in the 50s, even though it was distinctly discouraging when he turned to Catholicism. In spite of everything, what we are constantly seeing in his work is exemplary draftsmanship, a startling inventive talent and a sense of humour and of theatre. Surrealism owes a great deal to his pictures. Mm. The famous Lips Sofa originated in Dali's 1934-35 collage. In 1936, Dali's patron, Edward James, ordered five sofas to be made in London. Dali gave instructions for satin covering the colour of Mae West's lipstick, Shocking Pink. 
The first version was a single shade, but later models, somewhat altered and bigger, were made in two shades of pink. In 1936, Spain was being torn apart by civil war. Dali and Gala had to do without their retreats to Port Ligat. Instead, they travelled around Europe and spent some time living in Italy. The influence of the Renaissance masters Dali saw in the great art galleries of Florence and Rome is clearly apparent in the groups of figures he subsequently used in his paintings in order to establish multiple images, as in Spain, or the invention of monsters. The latter is one of his paintings on the subject of the premonitions of war. The artist explained that the foreground double figure holding a butterfly and hourglass was the pre-Raphaelite version of the double portrait of Dali and Gala immediately behind it. True to his principle of taking no interest in politics, Dali viewed the civil war that was tormenting his country merely as a delirium of edibles. He observed it as an entomologist might observe ants or grasshoppers. His friend Garcia Lorca was shot in his hometown of Granada which was under occupation by Franco's forces. This was ignoble, for they knew as well as I that Lorca was by essence the most apolitical person on earth. Lorca did not die as a symbol of one or another political ideology. He died as a propitiatory victim of that total integral phenomenon that was the revolutionary confusion. The disasters of war and revolution in which my country was plunged only intensified the wholly initial violence of my aesthetic passion. And while my country was interrogating death and destruction, I was interrogating that other sphinx of the imminent European becoming that of the Renaissance. His attitude was interpreted as typical Dali, superficial and frivolous. Hey mate, how's all that murdering gone? Busy? Yeah, mate, busy. 1937. At this time, Dali was designing material dresses and hats, above all cutlet hats, inkwell hats, shoe hats, skeleton dresses, dresses with drawers and so forth, for Schiaparelli, a ballet with costumes by Coco Chanel, for the Monte Carlo Ballet, and an opera, Tristan Insane, with music by Wagner. It was the time of the Munich Agreement and Dali was also putting the finishing touches to the enigma of Hitler and preparing his next exhibition in New York. He admitted that he did not yet know what the Hitler picture meant and that it was doubtless a transcription of dreams he had had after the Munich Agreement. However, he said the painting appeared to me to be charged with a prophetic value as announcing the medieval period which was going to spread its shadow over Europe. Chamberlain's umbrella appeared in this painting in a sinister aspect, identified with the bat. Sigmund Freud is always present in Dali's work. Even if a religious note is increasingly struck from this time on, Dali's comment on dream caused by the flight of a bee around a pomegranate a second before waking up was, for the first time, Freud's discovery that a typical narrative dream is prompted by something that wakes us was illustrated in a picture. If a bar falls on a sleeper's neck, 
It both wakes him and prompts a long dream that ends with the falling of the guillotine. Similarly, the buzzing of a bee in the painting prompts the bayonet prick that wakens Gala. The burst pomegranate gives birth to the entirety of biological creation. Bernini's elephant in the background bears an obelisk with the papal insignia. The dropping of the first atom bomb on Hiroshima on the 6th of August 1945 deeply shocked Dali. He expressed his response in works such as Melancholy, Atomic and Uranium Ideal, The Apothesis of Homer and The Three Sphinxes of Bikini. These paintings introduced a new technique which he called nuclear or atomic painting. The technique peaked in a masterpiece he completed in 1949, Lida Atomica. The mystical manifesto. For Dali, the atom bomb was the start of a new era. He succumbed to mysticism, nuclear mysticism as it were. The Hiroshima explosion coincided with his own classicist explosion. In his characteristically mischievous way, Art News commented, the possibility cannot be ruled out that Dali will be giving more attention to the conscious realm from now on than to the unconscious. If this does not improve the case, nothing need prevent him from becoming the greatest academic painter of the 20th century. After the war, Dali did not immediately return to Europe. The change from the psychoanalysis Dali to the nuclear physics Dali was making heavy demands on him. In his mystical manifesto, Dali described the change that was occurring in him at that time. Nothing more subversive can happen to an ex-surrealist in 1951 than, firstly, to become mystical, and secondly, to be able to draw. I am experienced both of these kinds of strengths simultaneously. Dali prophetically added, I foresee that the new art will be what I term quantum realism. It will take into account what the physicists call quantum energy, what mathematicians call chance, and what the artists call the imponderable beauty. Paths to immortality. I'm not the clown, but in its naivety, this monstrously cynical society does not see who is simply putting on a serious act, the better to hide his madness. I cannot say it often enough, I am not mad. My clear sightedness has acquired such sharpness and concentration that in the whole of the century, there has been no more heroic or more astounding personality than me. And apart from Nitschke, who finished by going mad though, my equal will will not be found in other centuries either. My painting proves it. <laughs> 
The picture of tomorrow will be a faithful image of reality, but one will sense that it is a reality pervaded with extraordinary life, corresponding to what is known as the discontinuity of matter. Velazquez and Vermeer were divisionists. They already intuited the fears of modern man. Nowadays, the most talented and sensitive painters merely express the fear of indeterminism. Modern science says that nothing really exists, and one sees scientists passionately debating photographic plates on which there is demonstrably nothing of a material nature. So artists who paint their pictures out of nothing are not so far wrong. Still, it is only a transitional phase. The great artist must be capable of assimilating nothingness into his painting, and that nothingness will breathe life into the art of tomorrow. Mr. Salvador Dali gives a party. The Spanish painter of surrealism dresses Mrs. Dali in a unicorn's head, just to start things off. As hostess, she presides from a red velvet bed. The party is a benefit for refugee artists, and costumes are supposed to represent the guests' bad dreams. Artist Dali wears ear flaps, representing anatomy. A puzzled guest, Bob Hope, sees the fish course served in satin slippers. Presumably, the fish is soul. Soldier Jackie Coogan and the still baffled Mr. Hope see the main course. The party is surrealism, but them frogs is real. The great catastrophe that was impending in Dali's own life happened on 10th of June 1982 when Gala died, leaving him alone. Dali tried to commit suicide by dehydrating. How serious was the attempt? He was convinced that dehydration and return to a pupil state would assure him of immortality. He had once read that the inventor of the microscope had seen minute, seemingly dead creatures through the lens of his invention, creatures that were in a state of extreme dehydration and which could be restored to life with a drop of water. Dali concluded, or at least liked the idea, that it was possible to live on beyond the point of dehydration. What he had not foreseen, though, was that, having consumed nothing for so long, it became impossible for him to swallow anything at all. From then till his dying day, he was fed liquid nutriments through a tube up his nose. Dali liked it all the time, a big Zenko and glow. Yes, but this for me is very good. Uh, recommendation because uh, in Greek gloom is synonymous of airness and Dali is the incarnation of the divine Hermes. Bring me chocolate, chocolate, big chocolate. Uh, I mean, papier chocolat, uh, the pepper, you know, the, the, the pepper for enveloping the, the chocolate. It is the name, the pepper. Uh, metallic, me, any kind of metallic, brilliant, and soft. <laughs> Silvering 